you know, the guide that I was t- connected to with a rope on this 17,000 foot ridge said through the wind, he said, if I fall to the left, he turned around and he's yelling through the wind. He says, if I fall to the left, you jump to the right, you know, and, and I looked down this ridge and it's like 2000 feet <laughs> down this way. It's like 6,000 feet down this way. And he was just saying, look, you know, if I start to fall one way, you're not going to like hold, hold the on. rope and yeah. catch yeah. me, right? Or dig in your crampons. You know, the only way I would catch him is if I literally just jump off, just me. jumped off the other side. Now, fortunately, we didn't get to that point, but, but, you know, you, you do recognize that there are points, you know, in your life or in your career where you have to be willing to like really like not just run towards something, but like jump. Welcome to Seeking Excellence. I'm Brett Pinniger. In my work, I help executives and teams be their best and achieve remarkable results. Reduce time to market, more rapid growth, higher levels of profitability, along with a better quality of life. Learn more about my coaching, peer groups, and training programs at brettpinniger.com. You can also follow me on social media at Brett Pinniger. Check the show notes for all the specifics. Seeking Excellence is all about helping us understand what makes leaders that are striving to be their best tick. What are their beliefs or mindsets about how the world works? What motivates them? And how do they bring their best to their work? And then we take those insights and uncover things we can all do to live and lead with more intention. If you enjoy this podcast, we would appreciate it if you take the time to rate, review, and share it with others. Now, let me introduce my guest, Vance Checkets. Vance is the senior executive for Dell EMC in Utah with over 1,300 employees and is part of Dell Technologies, the largest privately controlled IT company in the world. Last year, Vance was selected as one of Utah Business's CEO of the Year honorees. He's been with the company since 2007 when EMC acquired Mosey, where he was COO. Prior to Mosey, Vance worked at Oracle and Silicon Valley, WordPerfect, and Novell. In our discussion, Vance shares his thoughts on weathering storms and the life cycle of businesses, being authentic and learning from challenges. His philosophy that emphasizes relationships, risk-taking, speaking up, diversity and humility, focus and jumping into opportunities, and what he learned climbing on Mount McKinley and being told to jump if necessary, how he keeps himself grounded, diversity in the workplace, and how to build acceptance and love for others, the law of excellent people, and being rejuvenated by spending time out of doors and working out. I had a blast chatting with Vance. I think you'll love this conversation. Vance, it's great to be with you today. It's super great to be with you too, Brett. Let's talk a little bit about Dell EMC. Can you give our audience just a little bit of background on what you do and what Dell EMC is all about? Yeah, well, it's a common question and and a common conversation for me to have with people. Everyone knows Dell, it, you know, it seems, right? Sure. And, and that's, you know, thanks to Michael Dell and what he started in his college dorm room, you know, back, you know, quite a few years ago now. Um, and, and that is the same Dell, <laughs> right? It's not a different Dell. Um, the EMC part is r- really interesting because most people don't know about the EMC business. And it was a $25 billion business that combined with Dell uh, just a couple of years ago. Um, what's interesting about it is those two brands coming together are just one part of a bigger set of brands and technologies that we call Dell Technologies. And Dell Technologies is together the world's largest privately controlled information technology company. And we say privately controlled because some of the entities or the brands are in various stages of being public or private. Mm -hmm. So right now, Dell and Dell EMC are privately controlled, privately held. But, you know, because Michael Dell owns them with a few of his financial partners, um, you know, they that includes ownership of VMware, which is a public entity, or at least 80% ownership. Right, right. And we have another, you know, private and currently private entity that will be going public. And so, so Dell Technologies is this f- cool family of companies of which Dell EMC is one part. And Dell EMC is the part that focuses more on 
the enterprise, more on the data center and the cloud as opposed to the edge of the cloud or the desktop. So that's Dell. Um, and Dell, MC, Dell EMC is this enterprise brand or the data center brand. Does that, it does makes, that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Um, here in Utah, we've got about 1,300 people that work for the Dell EMC part of that equation. And, and the reason for that is because before this building that, that we're in here was uh, said Dell EMC on the, on the outside, it said EMC. Mm -hmm. So most of the people here came from that data center and enterprise division or, or company. Um, personally, I came into EMC when they acquired a small company called Mosey. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, what we do here is just about anything that can be done remotely to help our customers, uh, whether that's selling those products, supporting those products, implementing those products, uh, consulting around those products, or managing those products in, in a managed services or kind of a cloud and as a service uh, model. The infrastructure could be sitting anywhere on the planet. And, you know, we have teams here in Utah that manage that infrastructure, whether it's in a customer data center, one of ours, or, or a partner's. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a great introduction. And let's go right to the Mosey story, because I think that's kind of the beginning, at least for your significant leadership responsibilities. And you've been with this entity that has evolved from the Mosey days to now Dell EMC here. Yeah. And if it weren't for Mosey, none of this would be here. Right. So right. it really was Mosey, uh, which was acquired by EMC in 2007. I was the chief operating officer, so part of the executive team, but not the founder or the CEO. That was Josh Coates, mm -hmm. uh, and and love Josh and lots of cool stories, you know, with Josh, you know, before the acquisition, after the acquisition, and then after he left and went on uh, to do cool a few a few other cool things, including in structure. Uh, but I was, you know, one of the key executives and. Uh, you know, helped with that transition over into EMC and then really managed the business uh, completely after the acquisition inside of EMC. And at that point, it was like kind of like we were a, a well-funded and, and, and well-protected startup mm -hmm. inside this big company. And, and thank goodness, in hindsight, right, you know, we can look back and see what happened in 2008, you know, which was a difficult, you know, time for a lot of businesses. And we were safely inside of EMC. So we weathered that storm really well. We had plenty of other storms to weather, you know, as people showed up and said, hey, we've got this new security technology we want to implement. It's only going to cost you like $6 million. And we would say, are you kidding? We're, we're selling like the equivalent of online storage for backup purposes for five bucks a month, <laughs> you know, and our business can't support, you know, taken a six million dollar hit business, for yeah. some technology implementation so we had all kinds of interesting things that happened inside the company um but they weren't quite as uh you know th you know ex existentially they weren't threatening like you to ran us. out of cash or anything like right, that right 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 so it was a really it was a really you know fun and interesting place to be but mosey took all kinds of interesting you know twists and turns along the way inside of emc and of course you know some, you know, it's kind of the end of that story, at least as far as um, Dell EMC is concerned, is we just two weeks ago divested the Mosey business. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. So, so it has come full, full circle. Life cycle. About 10 years, right, from acquisition. And EMC's had a pattern of doing this, and even Dell's had a pattern of doing this. Uh, so uh, so it's, it's not, you know, there's, it's not like there's no precedent for this at all, but it is kind of coming now full circle, which has been really interesting to be a part of. Before we get into all the stories about Dell EMC and Mosey and what happened and leadership opportunities, I'd love to kind of just take the take us back in time here and uh, talk a little bit about for you the formative leadership milestones in your life. Obviously, as a COO of Mosey and now GM and VP of Dell EMC, you have significant leadership responsibilities. What do you look back as kind of being some of the defining milestones in your development as a leader? Uh, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them are the really tough times, right? You know, the or, or failures even, right? Where where you feel like, oh no, you know, what has happened? And it's interesting that 
know, I, I try and be my, my authentic self, you know, in whatever situation I'm in at home or at work. And sometimes those real, you know, tests didn't even come at, at the office. They came at home, you know, and there was something that was a severe challenge mm. or a struggle in my personal life. And, and I had to find balance or, or I learned from that and it benefited me professionally or the other way around. So, um, you know, I, I think of those really intense moments of change, transition, trauma, drama, you know, those have been, you know, the defining moments for me. Uh, so, you know, even things like the acquisition, right? I mean, that was a real defining moment, even leading up to the acquisition. I'll never forget, we were talking about to be acquired, you know, or to take a round of, fu of funding. Mm -hmm. And for me, the answer to that question was, was really obvious, depending on who you were in, in the, in the equation, right? For me, I wanted my tiny little stake in Mosey to get much bigger before we did anything like that. So I wanted to take the series A or mm -hmm. kind of, you know, semi B round that we had negotiated and grow that valuation. Um, you know, for the company, you know, I felt like, Hey, this, was a safe place for people to go and they'd have good jobs. And it was, um, and for Josh, I thought, gosh, anytime somebody offers you something and it ends in tens of millions of dollars, it's probably not a bad idea to just say yes. Right. So, um, you know, so that, that was, but that was a hard decision for me to make, you know, personally, because I wanted to do something different. And yet I was advising Josh, you know, to, you know, go down a, another path. Um, and then, and then what happened is we got on the other side of EMC and things started to change. You know, those were, all, there were multiple inflection points, right? You know, um, I thought I was kind of the boss in kind of running things and, and guess what? EMC acquired another company called Pi Corporation, um, ran, that was run by a, a gentleman named Paul Moritz, who's a brilliant executive that came from Microsoft in the very early days and, and all of a sudden he was my new boss and we had combined Mosey with his company called Pi Corporation. And there were some tremendous experiences and challenges, you know, associated with that. They had no, uh, customers with no revenue <laughs> and a big burn rate, you know, and here Mosey was barely break even, right. And, and trying to grow. And all of a sudden we went from in the black to heavily in the red as this combined entity. And, and I find myself struggling with all these other brilliant executives, but this big executive team had come from Pi and kind of me, you know, and a small it be a team. little bit overwhelming. Yeah, very overwhelming. And so those kind of moments of truth where you're under pressure or you have a lot of stress or, you know, strain, you know, really cause you to kind of go to what's most important, you know, really quickly. You either pack your bags and go home, mm -hmm. right? Or you just really say, okay, what's most important here? You know, what are the key objectives that I've got? You know, who are the key people that are going to help me on that journey? And let's march forward. Well, let's talk about you know, any one of them you want to talk about here, but let's talk about maybe some key learnings that came from those things. So maybe it's the story of Pi and, and Mosey coming together and some of the difficulties you learned there, or maybe even roll back the clock earlier in your life here. What would be, um, what was kind of the, the key learning or takeaway from those experiences? Well, you know, a really early one, you know, right here, my tech career really started at WordPerfect. Mm. Um, and... And I just needed a job, you know, when I was wrapping up my bachelor's degree, I started working in the warehouse at WordPerfect and, um, and, you know, took the opportunity that got presented when people were throwing away computers and I was working in the warehouse and I was the guy throwing them away. And I said, Hey, can I have one of these? And they said, sure, you have a couple. And these are like old 286 machines yep. or something like that. We're, you know, it's old people can, you know, Relate remember to those, those remember those days. Even, exactly. So, so anyhow, my first few computers, so I kind of took advantage of that opportunity. I ended up moving myself into the supply chain team and pretty soon I was a buyer. I was like buying stuff for this, you know, cool growing company. And, you know, and then I was the manager of the purchasing department and it was like really, you know, turned into this great job with this great company, but I was on the business side. Well, then, uh, you know, WordPerfect made the decision as they were going to implement this new financial system. And they went out to bid and did all this work to find the right system. And they, they selected Oracle ERP, Oracle Financials mm -hmm. and some other applications. And they said, we need 
we need a subject matter expert from different parts of the business to be on the project team to help us, you know, work this implementation. And here I am, you know, I, you know, a pretty new guy in supply chain management, you know, and uh, and they say, you know, we need somebody. And I raised my hand and I said, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. So taking risks like that has been another key part of, of my success, you know, going back to very, very early in my career, not being afraid to take risks and then build relationships. So risks and relationships are two key elements of, of my own personal success that I can look back on and say, that was a big risk, right? I was pretty maxed out already with, you know, school and a job and a young family. And here I am now volunteering for this new project at work. That was the beginning of me moving into more of the, you know, IT and then engineering side. And, and frankly, that's the job that got me an, an offer from Oracle when I'd finished up my my MBA and, and Oracle now knew me as, you know, a very vocal and, you know, smart person on their products that, you know, had a vision for where they could go in the future. And so I, I had taken some risks and then I'd built some relationships that, took me to Silicon Valley and it was in Silicon Valley where I met Josh Coates for the first time. That's what connected us when we both ended up back here in Utah, which is what got me into Mosey. So relationships and risks. Relationships, risks. There are two other things though that I think that are coming out of our conversation that I like to dig in a little bit. One is your willingness to speak up. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, maybe that's a part of taking risks, but it's not just doing risky things. It's actually speaking your mind here and, and speaking up. That's what got you the job at Oracle, it sounds like. Yeah. Um, how do you do that? And how do you do that well? Well, I'm not afraid of public speaking. I'm not afraid of putting myself out there a little bit. But But the other thing that's really important too, Brett, is... I, I know I'm not always the smartest person in the room and or, or on the team. And I like to surround myself with people who are smart <laughs> and frankly, who are different than me, who don't see eye to eye. You know, Josh was a, was a great example where there were several times where Josh and I just disagreed on things. And yet we have a great relationship to this day. Um, and so having diversity is also really important to me. And then being humble enough, and I'm, I, you know, it's easy to say you're humble. I try to be humble um, so that when you hear the great ideas that come from the room, from the team, from your peers and others around you, that you're, you're, you're willing to get behind those and say, that's a great idea. Or, hey, let's do this. You know, so-and-so just said that and I think we should spend some more time on it. that's really really awesome and so I you know I, I can be an extrovert I can be introverted a lot sometimes too but since I'm comfortable in the in the extrovert world a lot of times I hear the introverts and who are oftentimes where many of the brilliant ideas come from and I can take that idea or that question and, and champion that, um, you know, for them. So I, I can't even take credit for all the brilliant things that may have come out of my mouth because they probably originated somewhere else first. We're going to get back to this humility thing because it's absolutely critical from what I see in great leaders is their ability to maintain their humility. One of, one of the other themes that I want to talk about briefly is this idea that you can adapt because not many executives would have been through as many transitions as you've been through. You know, you started out at Mosey or before that Oracle Mosey and then from there to EMC and then EMC to Dell EMC, you've, you've been through a series of transitions. And so what from your, a leadership perspective has enabled you to um, make those transitions great opportunities for you? Yeah. Well, I, I, I oftentimes call them pivots, you know, and that's where I feel most comfortable is when I can find a common thread, you know, or pivot point, right, to say, I'm going to leverage this experience. I don't know, think about word perfect, right? In supply chain management, I'll, I'll be it relatively brief to pivot into IT and implementing this big, you know, software application ERP, you know, thing from Oracle, um, working with a, a bunch of consultants and, and IT. And IT, right? And then I pivot. You know, I pivoted from there into Oracle, um, or actually, there were a couple of other pivots, right? I pivoted into Novell, right? You know, and did the same thing at Novell. Um, pivoted from there into Oracle. So, you know, pivoting where where I can find a base of strength, and the strength comes usually from either skills, 
you know, that I possess, experiences that I've had, or the relationships. Relationships are so key because I might be doing something, you know, very new or different, but if I'm doing it with some people that I know, that I trust, and, and they know I've got, you know, maybe just some you know, some raw horsepower that, that will be helpful, even though I don't have the domain expertise or I don't have a particular experience in, in that um, specific area, but there's trust and they know that I'll learn that stuff and pick it up. Pivoting, you know, from a point of strength or, or expertise or comfort into an area of unknown and discomfort is, is I think, a, you know, a, a real important thing or that's been an important thing for me. Where do you think the idea of, of sort of running towards the pain first kind of came into your life here? Because many of us will say, oh, that looks a little bit painful. I'm going to maybe avoid that or maybe not be quite as in as you're, you're just all in. You're running towards the fire. You're running towards the pain it feels like. I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I literally think of like some of my experiences, you know, in the mountains, right, of Utah. Um, and New England, even when I was younger or, or cycling, you know, I, you know, yeah. I like to take some calculated risks, but you know, I'll never forget, uh, one time climbing Mount McKinley, which was a, a brilliant achievement. Um, and one that really helped me hone some of my skills around focus. And I'll never forget going up the ridge from, um, 17,000 feet to, uh, uh, you know, to the next camp and, you know, the guide that I was t connected to with a rope on this 17,000 foot ridge said through the wind, he said, if I fall to the left, he turned around, he's yelling through the wind. He says, if I fall to the left, you jump to the right, you know, and, and I looked down this ridge and it's like 2000 <laughs> feet down this way. It's like 6,000 feet down this way. And he was just saying, look, you know, if I start to fall one way, the, you're not going to like hold, hold the on. rope and yeah. catch yeah. me, right? Or dig in your crampons. You know, the only way I would catch him is if I literally just jump off, just jumped off the other side. Now, fortunately we didn't get to that point, but, but, you know, you, you do recognize that there are points, you know, in your life or in your career where you have to be willing to like really like not just run towards something, but like jump, you know, it's one thing when you can, you know, have one foot on the ground at a time, you know, you know, runner's gate, you sure. know, leaves yeah. the ground completely, you know, at, at points in their stride, but to literally jump, you know, into something with, with both feet. Now I said already, I like to pivot. I like to maintain some point of, of strength, but there, but there are a few times where you just are holding on, right. With a, with a real thin thread. And, and I would say, you know, I practice some of those things in my personal life as well. You know, just having a large family, right? I got a, I got a, a large family. I mean, that was a big risk. That was kind of a little bit unknown to me. I didn't know what that was going to be like. And it's been difficult, it, but it's also been really beautiful and rewarding too. So, so I've practiced that, you know, in my personal life and in my professional life, taking risks, you know, jumping ru or running at least into Love it. you know opportunities as I see them. Love it. So let's come back to humility. Yeah. How do you keep yourself grounded? Um, I, did I mention my large family? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some, you know, that that's it really is a is a good thing. You know, because those relationships are are ones where there's kind of this Im implied you know trust, right? Where it's like I'm connected to those to those people in a very you know intimate way, and and they will let me know, right? When there's something that's a little bit out of whack. Um, and, and my wife in particular, right. She's, you know, she's not afraid to, to say, Hey, time out. That doesn't sound right. Or, Hey, you promised this, or mm. you said that. Um, and, and, and that's really, really helpful in terms of me staying grounded. I try to do the same thing in the office too. Um, and it's interesting to see some of the, the blend, you know, of, of my philosophies, um, something that I did in the office to stay grounded and connected to the people um, that I work closely with is it's called the one on one, mm. right? I think hopefully every good manager and leader, you know, has regular one on one conversations with their team to find out what's going on and how they can help and just, um, you know, getting to know their teams as well. I was doing this in the office and feeling pretty connected and pretty grounded in the office. And there was a point in my life where I was not connected and not grounded in my personal life. 
and I felt like things were a little bit out of control and like, Hey, at work, things are going really well and I'm being successful and everything's awesome. But I come home and it just, it's a little crazy. Right. And it wasn't just, you know, a bunch of young kids. Um, I started doing one-on-ones mm. at home on my calendar so that my kids knew that on Saturday at 9 a.m. or Sunday at 4 p.m. or whatever it was, or Tuesday at 6, I'm looking at my watch and my calendar saying, hey, we, we got a we got a one-on-one. Like, where are you, you know? That's awesome. And I started taking notes in those one-on-ones wow. as well. And I was following up from week to week saying, hey, you, you said you were working on this. Like, how did that go? You know, things that I would have never remembered otherwise. Um, so, so simple little things you know, like a technique that I took from the office to my home have kept me connected and grounded to the people, you know, that are really what's what's most important. And, and even in this place, right? I mean, yeah, we're the world's largest privately controlled information technology company, but we're a people company. We just are in the tech business. And so connections to people um, are the thing that keep me grounded both at work and at home. Fantastic. Love that. Sometimes um, as leaders, we need to hear stuff that we don't hear. We need to create an environment where people really speak. You clearly mentioned a couple of times your desire and willingness to listen. How do you actually um, help people feel like you're going to take what they say and that, that it will really be meaningful to you versus you know, them saying, well, he's listening, but he's not really listening? How do you really engage them in a way they, they've developed trust in you as a leader? Well, you know, that, that trust, that kind of trust only comes by actually, you know, walking the walk and walking the talk, you know, just help people feel safe, right? I mean, that's, people aren't going to share or aren't going to say things unless they feel safe. So I, I try to be approachable, you know, I'm, I'm busy, um, but my calendar is always available, you know, and anybody, right, in the entire company can look for my free busy time and mm-hmm. drop something on my calendar. And I might be three weeks out or, you know, something like that, but Hey, you know, get on my calendar. And if it's really super urgent, come knock on my door. Um, but you know, the diversity, you know, aspect is something that's, you know, I think really helped people feel safe when they recognize that we value diversity and all of its different shapes and forms. And one of the things that we do here at, at Dell EMC, that's really great that you can do when you're in a big company is we have these diversity groups um, for the Latino community, for uh, for women, for the LGBT community, for uh, veterans and, uh, you know, people with different abilities. And it's called true ability uh, for caregivers. And we have mm. all these different affinity groups that people feel an immediate connection to, right? They can pivot really easily into those mm-hmm. groups. And, and that's a great networking tool it. because you get to know people and you immediately just feel safe when we can walk into the room and say, Hey, I'm adopted. And you say, I'm adopted too. And like, you know, that bond, that connection is so strong. We feel this instant safety that allows me to share things that I probably wouldn't share with anybody else that, you know, wasn't adopted. I'm, I'm not actually adopted, but we do have, you know, a, a child, um, And, uh, and so I, you know, I certainly understand, you know, that, and that connection just really helps people feel safe and willing to speak. So I have to put myself out there a little bit. I have to show and walk, you know, the walk, um, you know, we recently had, uh, you know, a member of our team who was, uh, doing, going through a gender transition. Mm -hmm. And so we got up and talked about it with their permission very openly in the office so that people could understand it. And I had a lot of people come up to me afterwards and said, I I don't agree with that. I don't understand that, but I accept that. And I accept where that person is and I will respect them on their journey through life. Um, And had a lot of other people come up to me and say, oh my gosh, I totally get where that person is coming from because my friend, my family member, whatever. And when you have moments like that where you've extended yourself or you've, 
you know, created a, an environment where people feel, you know, connected, where they yeah. feel safe, where they feel love, yep. right? I wish we talked more about love in the workplace. We just have to talk just about yeah. what kind of love. <laughs> <laughs> but we, you know, we want people to feel safe, you know, when, yeah. they, when they come to work. And when they feel safe, they talk. Yeah, I, I love this idea of creating communities that create safety by their inherent affinity yeah. towards each other. And yeah. the, the ability that, that gives you to create a foundation of safety in an organization, always a home base that you can go to and feel good and comfortable with. That's just fantastic. What's your leadership philosophy? How would you describe your approach or your philosophy as a leader? Well, I think I've mentioned, you know, a few of those things. One of them is, you know, humility and and trying to recognize the people and the great ideas that, you know, that that are around you um, as a leader. Um, I also really believe a lot in the the law of excellent people. Hmm. I don't know if you've heard of Tell this. Tell me more about this. Well, M- Mark Andreessen gets the credit for creating what he called the law of crappy people. Um, and I just, you know, have pivoted from that to say, Eh, you know, that's kind of a, a negative view of the world. I'm I'm an optimist, right? And so I, you know, rather than saying, hey, you know, if you hire, his law says, you know, if you as soon as you hire a B player, you know, they're not going to hire an A player. They probably wouldn't even hire another B player because that would even be intimidating. They're going to hire a C player. And so you begin this downward spiral, you know, of organizational decay. You hire an A player, of course. They're not going to hire a B player, right? They're going to hire another A player. They might even try to find an A plus player because they want to be part of a super high performing team where they can learn and grow. So, you know, I've I've always tried to adhere to that to that philosophy, and it's and it's hard, especially when you bring someone in, and it's not that they're maybe even a, a B player. It sometimes is just not a good fit. Mm. You know, they're just in the wrong role and maybe in the wrong company. And I've seen other people, you know, leave you know, my team or my company, um, the company that I was in and go somewhere else and be really successful and, and helping people make that journey, you know, is, is really important, you know, trying to find excellent people, a players, bring them into the team, recognize, support them, love them. And, and then the people that aren't successful and they're performing at a B level and helping them find a place where they can, you know, be true to their, you know, desires hopefully to be an A person. Um, that those are those are some of the things. So right. you know, humility and the law of excellent people. So if we set aside uh, humility and the law of excellent people, if you were to talk to people that report to you, how would they describe your leadership style? Um, I don't know. They're just sitting around the corner. <laughs> Let's pull a few <laughs> we, of them we in. We could. It'd <laughs> but, be interesting. Um, you know, I think I think they would all they would always say. In fact, w- when we uh, when we buried the time capsule for this building they put a quote on the time capsule that was a quote from me and they it was i think the quote was we are you know quote we are wildly optimistic you know end quote vance check it's you know whatever the date was and and i think they all know that that i am an optimist and i like to say yes to things but i call it the qualified yes so even when we were out of space right in our first building just 2 miles away from here you know, parts of the then EMC business would, you know, leaders would come to me and they would say, hey, we want to put a new team in Utah, you know, can you can you take them? And I would always say, you know, my team would say, oh boy, here goes Vance, he's going to say yes. <laughs> and then they'd be like, where are we going to put these people? I'm like, get out some folding tables, you know, yeah, <laughs> like stick some people in the corner. Let's just make it happen, you know? And, uh, and so they, they, they would say Vance, you know, is wildly optimistic, right? He's got this vision and he's going to, you know, march forward, you know, and we're going to help, you know, work through all the details. There's always a qualification to, yes, we'll take on your new team and yes, we'll hire some more people. It's going to be a little bit tight, right? right? They might be sitting on folding tables and chairs for the first six months, but we'll then go build some space out, right? Go lease some additional space, whatever. And look at where we are today, right? We have this beautiful new building. So wild optimism, I think they would say. Um, and then, uh, you know, just a, a, a real person. I'm, I'm, I'm a human, you know, I'm not perfect. I, I know I can make mistakes and, and I'm, you know, willing to apologize for them and, and clean them up. Um, so I, I hope, yeah, that's I hope great. that's what they'd that's, say. That's fantastic here. What do you do to stay sort of at your best as a leader? So what are some of the maybe private practices people wouldn't see things you do every day or regularly that really sort of 
energize you and motivate you? Yeah, well, there is one thing that's a Stephen Covey thing. So shout out to, you know, Stephen Covey. Um, uh, saw time on my mm. calendar every day. There's something called saw time, and it's it's a direct reference to sure. sharpening the saw. Yeah. Uh, and and that's important to me to always have a little bit of a just a, a kind of a moment where I can just say, okay, what just happened? <laughs> what do I need to do? How did my priorities just change? How did my schedule just change? You know, and you know, how do I get, just get grounded again? Um, that's one little thing that I do, you know, every day. Um, the other thing that I do, I already told you I can, I'm comfortable in the introvert world as well, is I, I really love nature. And it's super important for me to get out of the office and out of even my house and and go into the mountains or, or, or somewhere in nature and just, you know, you know, have this spiritual connection with, with the world and, and with God for me is really important as well. And that doesn't always happen every day. Mm-hmm. Saw time does, you know, but there's probably, you know, five days a week where I am somewhere out in the hills or outside, you know, just doing some of what my research. What would be some of the things that occur during saw time? Um, uh, you know, I look at my calendar, I look at my to-dos and my priorities, or sometimes I just take a deep breath, you know, and just say, okay, it's, you know, and because my, my schedule is usually back to back to sure. back to back, right? And so it's that time where I can just, you know, take a deep breath or I, I, I do something, you know, personal. I might even get up and go for a walk or, you know, get something to eat or drink, at, you know, just, just, it's just me, your it's, time. it's me time, it's you know, reflection time, it's regroup time, it's, you know, reprioritize time, it's sharpening the saw. Fantastic. Well, nature is also clearly a really important part of this here. What are some of the fun things you like to do in the outdoors? Clearly mountain climbing or mountaineering yeah, as well. Yeah, I love to get up into the mountains. You know, people always say, well, so do you ski? And I'm like, I, 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 I enjoy skiing, but, you know, like when I backcountry ski, I, I love going up probably even more than I love going down. I love skinning more than, uh, yeah, than skiing. I'll skin up to these places and then I'll be like, oh my gosh, can I skin back down? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, can I just flip those skins around and just kind of inch my way back down the hill? You know, and of course, all my friends are like, ah, oh, can you just carry me up and then I'll ski down? And um, But but biking um, would, would be higher on the list than skiing for me. Road biking, mountain biking. I do have a fat tire bike. Um, but... You know, it's, when I travel, especially, I love to just, you know, put on some trail running shoes and find the closest piece of dirt, you know, and just hit a dirt trail through some trees or a park or something like that. And and the mountains are just a bonus. So that's my probably my first love is just some trail running or hiking shoes and uh, and just hit the mountains. And, and if it's snowing, even better. It just means fewer people, and I have to worry less about staying on trails because I can just put my snowshoes on and go up, you know, anywhere, you know, do anything. Um, and then if I can stay there for a night or two, even better. So, you so know, camping, camping as well. Camping That's is, great. Camping is fun too. What's the most interesting adventure that you've had recently in the mountains? Um, recently? Um, it would probably be a trip to Alaska, um, last summer. It was phenomenal, totally off the grid up in, you know, the wilderness of Southeastern Alaska. Um, it was just breathtaking. Wonderful. So it was the spiritual aspect of it, it was the recharging aspect of it. It, it will, like. it was also, there was, a, it was, it involved a lot of hard work too, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and that's a story for, for like another podcast, how, how I even, got to this place where I was, but, um, but yeah, there, there was some f- serious physical work, physical work, but that was also purging for me too. That's sometimes yeah. I feel like when I'm just, sw- I just sweat, sweat it, it out. out, you know, I just, is there's this purging that is really rejuvenating for me too. So, um, but yeah, a spiritual and a physical renewal, um, and, and this Southeastern Alaskan experience. Okay. And was do you just, typically do it in groups or are you more on your own? Um, you know, because I will, I will find time. It seems like lately it's been more evening time. Mm -hmm. Um, even on my bike, you know, for those who are familiar with corner Canyon, you know, if you look up there at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night, you oftentimes see a little light somewhere. I'm probably one of those lights, you know, a few days a week. 
Um, so because I'm doing it usually at odd times, I have a few people that I'll just call randomly and say, hey, I'm heading up to Corner Canyon or text them, you know, and say, hey, I'm going to hit the trail in about 30 minutes. And every once in a while, someone will take me up on it. Um, so I'm very comfortable going alone. Um, and I, and I, and I need that. Um, but I, I will occasionally do Both it in groups, groups too. Well. So awesome. the Alaska trip was, uh, with my brother, his son, my wife and, and our son. So we had, you know, a few of us together on that Alaska trip. And, but, and, and yesterday morning I was, uh, you know, you know, on the top of South mountain with a friend who'd hiked up from Lehigh and I'd hiked up from Draper and we met on the top of South mountain and you know, did a little loop and very cool, but it just depends. That's awesome. A great way to recharge and great way to connect with the outside world at large. Yeah. Who are some of your great leader, um, uh, p- great leaders you like to look to or that you respect or you, um, that you try to admire or even emulate? Um, you know, I, I get asked this question, you know, pretty regularly and I don't have like this short list of, you know, people or, or books even, um, you know, people say mm-hmm. like, who, you know, who, you know, like, who's your inspirational person? Who's your inspiration or where, what inspirational book is, is yours? I, you know, I, I, I like to draw my inspiration from a pretty broad range of sources. And, and I oftentimes talk about men, people who have mentored me. And I think, I, you know, I don't know that I have a real formal set of mentors, I, I like to think of my life, um, you know, as a series of interactions and relationships um, that, that, you know, will add value to me and I hope to add value to whoever else is part of that experience or that relationship too. And so, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I think I have a, a lot of people that I look to on a, on a regular basis, um, you know, there's a, uh, you know, a woman in my neighborhood who, um, who recently moved into an assisted living facility up in, uh, Washington state. And, you know, she came, she came back into town to visit some other friends and family. And she stopped by my house. I wasn't there. Mm. Um, and she was kind of dependent on a family member who was giving her a ride, but she called me and she said, Vance, I just wanted you to know, I, I stopped by your house and so I'm sorry I missed you. And, and it, it just, you know, just my heart welled up inside of me to think, you know, that this, this woman, right, who's years my senior, right, not connected, you know, through any kind of blood relationship mm-hmm. at all, but because we had struck up a friendship while she was in the same neighborhood and we had several interactions with her and, and she called me and, and asked me about my kids and what was going on in my life you know, it was just, it was this beautiful moment, right? With this, this woman that has had a big influence on my life that, you know, like nobody in the office knows this woman, you know, and, and if I said her name, you would just be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, but, but she's had a real powerful, you know, impact on my life because almost because there wasn't this glory and this fame and and riches and any other reason, right, for me to be connected to her or her to be connected and care about me. It was, it was this just beautiful human interaction, right? And um, and so and her name is Emily, you know. So I would say Emily is one of those people that I really look up to, who's influenced my life in a real powerful way. And and even now she's not even, you know, physically that close. It's not even, you know, as easy to you know, to chat with her, um, you know, they're still, still there. They're still influenced. So those are the kinds of people, those are the kinds of relationships that I think have, you know, real and lasting influence on me. Now, Michael Dell's been to my house. <laughs> that was a memorable experience, you know, and, you know, what a personality and an amazing individual, um, you know, but I'd put him right upside next to Emily. Fantastic. It's where your humility comes out. It's the people, it's individuals, it's those relationships. Yeah. What advice would you give your, to your former self if you were to kind of do it again? If you were to say, I, I can go back to my 21-year-old self and give myself some advice, what, what advice would you give? Yeah, I, I think I was, you know, I got exposed to tech. You know, my dad was working for Digital Equipment Corporation. When we lived in Massachusetts, he was working for DEC, you know, one of the big tech giants of the day that is gone mm-hmm. <laughs> um, right now. And uh, 
And I don't think I really, you know, understood or appreciated that. I don't know that I would have gotten a, a degree other than English literature for my bachelor's, <laughs> which that's my, I love that, right? You know, people talk about diversity and they talk about, hey, you know, is it too late for me? And I'm like, no, I got an English degree, right? And and I love my English degree. And I, I sometimes wonder, would I get a different degree? But I probably would have, I would have paid more attention to technology um, and, and, and the world around me. And it's hard, you know, when you're a teenager, or even in your early 20s, you're oftentimes so self-absorbed, right? You don't take the opportunity to look at the world. And I, and I was climbing mountains and doing things at that time, but it was more for my own personal thrill and satisfaction and, and accomplishment as opposed to understanding the world in which I lived and, and, and feeling that connection with everything else around me. It was much more, you know, self-absorbed. So I don't know if you can get away from that as a, you know, teenager or even early 20 something. Um, but, but that's what I would try and tell myself. I would say, Hey, pay a little bit more attention, you know, to the things that are happening around you. Um, and, and like, for example, your dad's job, right. And he's working for this really cool technology company. And of course, you know, had I known that I was going to be working for like this huge East Coast technology company 20, 30 years later or whatever it was, like, you know, that, that would have been really interesting to tell myself. Um, and nowadays, technology is just, is just a part of any, you know, profession you might choose or any degree. And, and so I would certainly say to anyone who's listening, pay attention to technology. You don't have to be a computer scientist, right? But understand technology. Don't just use it blindly. Understand. And, and, and it, will, it will be a good thing, right? When you know what the cloud is and where all your personal information is going, you might act a little differently. That's right. um, so so that's, that's one of the things I would say is just, hey, lift your head up a little bit more. Try and think outside the, you know, the box that you're in. Get out in. of the bubble that you're yeah, in. Yeah, get out of the bubble and, and technology in particular. So a couple of uh, just quick questions in closing here, sort of uh, help you sort of fit in the range of all the leaders we've talked to so far here. Would you say you're more likely to lead from the front or the back? Uh, from the front. And why do you enjoy leading from the front or why do you choose to do that? Well, I mean, I, I think I'm comfortable, you know, in the, in the middle you know, or from the back, well, more comfortable from the middle. And, and I think about bike racing all the time too. When you're on the back of the pack, it is really hard. It's a grind. It's a grind, right? And if you fall off the back for a minute, you know, the, the, the middle or the middle half, you know, is a really good place to be. Um, the front's a great place to be too, but, you know, you better have a team, you know, that's working with you yeah. or you're going to be burning out pretty fast. So, you know, I, I definitely... Not not a back of the pack kind of a guy. Middle front, middle to front, and uh, you know, and and you know, if if you're a cyclist, you know what I mean. I do indeed. Yeah. Are you more of a big picture or detail oriented person? Big picture. You know, when you ask my wife, like, is Vance balanced? You know, she'd say, well, <laughs> if you if you look at it the way he does, yeah, he's really well balanced. But he looks at it on six month increments. You know. <laughs> Some people look for balance on a day to day, you mm -hmm. know, and there are d days and weeks where I, it's like crazy busy or maybe I'm traveling or something like that. And it's all work, right? You know, like, you know, 12 hour, 14 hour days and, you know, travel in between and it's just, you know, all work. And then I take off and go to Alaska and it's all, you know, play or personal and just, you know, disconnect time. So you have to, for me... I have to look at the bigger picture. And my, when we do our family finances, it's the same thing. My wife's looking at the weekly, yep. you know, and I'm looking at the... The yearly. Know, the yearly, right? So um, so a big picture for right. sure. Would you say that you are more of a rule maker or a rule breaker? Um, I, I, this is where I... I, you know, I like to say yes to things, right? <laughs> you know, can we, and. can we break this rule? Well, of course, it, with the quali following qualification, right. right, that you do some other things, right? And can I break this rule? So I, I'm, I'm more of a, in, in, in my, you know, effort to, you know, compromise as well, I would say I'm a rule bender. I like that. I like that. <laughs> would you say you're internally or externally motivated? Um, I, I really depend a lot on, you know, validation from, from people around me and, and in my environment. I'm very, 
Um, you know, I think I, you might, some might even say I'm, I'm sometimes codependent, mm -hmm. you know, which is not necessarily a good thing, overly dependent mm -hmm. on people and the feedback that I get from, you know, around me. But, but then I go off and do these things solo that are just, that nobody sees or knows that are just very internal to me too. So, so I feel like I, you know, I, I get motivation and inspiration, you know, both kind of very internal and personal to me, but, but it's important to have that, that backdrop of, you know, my interpersonal connections as well. So a little, a little bit of both. Really. Love it. Communication style. Are you more of a direct hard hitting communicator or more of a sort of uh, ease into the conversation, kind of get rid of some of the pain and try and make it a little simpler for people? Um, so it's a little bit different, you know, when it comes to written versus oral and what it is we're talking about. If we have some hard things to talk about, I'm going to ease into that conversation. I'm going to say, hey, Brett, some really good things are happening and, you know, really excited about this and congratulations on that. Now here's some tough news. And, you know, and, and, you know, but be very direct about yeah. that, you know, so in, and in writing, you know, I like bullet points, you know, I like to be able to say, Hey, we got four things that are really important. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> you know, and if there's a priority, even better put numbers, you know, on the bullet points. So I like to be, you know, crisp, concise, very direct, especially when it comes to writing, you will never get a multiple page email from me ever. Love it. Love it. Vance, this has been great. How do people that are um, listening to the podcast follow you or keep track of you on social media? Well, Twitter, you know, you know, V Checkets um, is my Twitter handle, and I've been pretty active the last few years trying to just share what's going on in my personal and my professional life. Um, so, so that's certainly a good way. And LinkedIn, um, you know, I'm I'm pretty active there too. I, I am on Facebook, but don't bother because I just am not. I'm a I'm. I exist, but I'm not very active on, on Facebook and same with Instagram and Snapchat. So Twitter and LinkedIn. Love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your leadership approach with us today. It's been insightful and a lot of fun. My pleasure, Brett. Thank you. Thanks.